Hi, and welcome to The Purposeful Banker, the leading commercial banking podcast brought to you by Q2 Precision Lender, where we discuss the big topics on the minds of today's best bank. I'm your host, Alex Habit. So a few months ago, Neil Stanley, a deposit expert and founder of The Core Point, came onto the show to help bring a little bit more of a clear perspective uh, into the world of deposits, you know, especially given today's interest uh, as an industry. And that interest has certainly not waned over the last couple of months. In fact, it's uh, remained as intense, if not more, right? Uh, in the very recent uh, news cycles, uh, it's been all about some pretty significant downgrades, uh, at least in terms of number of institutions uh, across a wide midsection of banks, you know, within the nation. So it's a, it's a good number of them uh, experiencing downgrades. And now uh, a lot of the other rating agencies are coming in line with that. Um, the Fed continues raising the rates, though uh, it's uh, decidedly no longer clear what the future sentiment will be, right? Uh, a lot of it seems mixed, right? You're getting perhaps some clear signals from some parties, but less clear signals from others. The data is uh, showing some positive uh, I- indications. However, there are some other numbers that remain obviously uh, below agreed upon thresholds that that are targeted. But, you know, even as the Fed has continued this campaign over the last year and a half, raising rates, uh, there appears to be an interesting opportunity uh, that can be had as we've as we've been along this upward slope, right? So Neil sent me this really enthusiastic email uh, where he basically pointed to the fact that there is uh, potentially a huge opportunity there. And prefaced it by pointing to an article that he had published in the summer of 2022, aptly titled, The Next Refinance Boom May Not Even Be in Mortgages. So with that in mind, I invited Neil to come back to the show and and tell us the story of this opportunity, right? Um, no better time like the present and where we are in this cycle to, to see, well, how can there be places where banks can uh, uniquely insert a new competitive advantage. And uh, there's no better person than Neil to help us guide through that conversation. I hope you enjoy it. So it's been, uh, you know, we, we've, we've now have a decent amount of mileage um, on this rate hike uh, campaign uh, for a while now. So I, you know, before we dig into anything, uh, new since the last time we talked. I just was curious, you know, as as an expert specifically um, from the deposits point of view, how would you tell the story of where we are uh, today? Mm-hmm. It's the end of August, um, and you know this has been going on for a while now. There's been a lot of headlines, uh, certainly this year and even last year. I just want to hear what's what's Neil Stanley's take on where we are now. And just at a macro level, where you think we're going towards over the next six months to 12 months, you know, as a, as a backdrop, uh, so to speak. It's a nice big question. Uh, so the first thing that pops into my mind is that the, uh, the old phrase about the market being in the short run, a voting machine, and in the long run, a weighing machine. Uh, That seems to be very pertinent uh, today because we've had so many opinions about how we couldn't stand these interest rates. Yeah, we seem to be standing them pretty well. And the the market is, uh, the the Wall Street is having to reacclimate their their expectations. Um, I can tell you that anytime we had negative real interest rates, and we probably talked about this last time, that you know that rates have to go up. But now that we have positive real interest rates, it's it's anybody's guess as to where it where it goes. I tend to think we're kind of where we're going to be for a while. Uh, so, uh, but the market hasn't quite accepted that until recently. In fact, in the last uh, month, you're going to see that the, the the Fed funds futures has changed a lot for the end of 24. Uh, we're now kind of predicting that 450 might be the the Fed funds rate at the um, what that would be 15 months from now. So that's kind of where we're at, Alex. So uh, clearly not going anywhere close to where we were before, 
Uh, but no. a slight, slight drop, you know, potentially maybe just a, a, a normalization drop uh, for the long term. But you're yeah. suggesting that we should all just get comfortable and cozy um, because th- what we're experiencing today is by and large a proxy for what what longer term might feel like, um, you know. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. I think uh, the the near future is not going to look like the near past. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to look like the far past either. It's it's going to be a different future with technology and with interest rates that are non-trivial. So we're going to have people learning about managing money that never even thought that they could make money uh, managing their money. They just thought, oh, interest rates are nothing. Uh, they're trivial. And so it doesn't really matter what I do with my money. Now it matters what I do with my money. Right. So it, it's changing, Alex. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, So it's interesting. You know, the, the reason I asked this question to you, again, given that we're towards the end or uh, you know, the, the summer of 2023 is is slowly wrapping up. But early on in the in the campaign, a lot of the experts were pointing to the summer of 2023 as that's where you're going to see the major effects start to come in from the rate hikes. Right. And I think what we're, uh, you know, most would agree, uh, and a lot of this is based on sentiment uh, in the media, is that, uh, you know, the, the potential for the soft landing is higher than it was before. Uh, it was a much more pessimistic view uh, in 2022 of what the summer of 2023 could look like. And while inflation, again, is is doing better, is not within the target range of the Fed. Uh, so the the, this, the media engine is also today in full swing where a lot of, um, you know, the, the experts are making the case for further hikes or against further hikes. Um, you, you're, you're suggesting that the, will there be any more, or you, you think we're, we're going to start to hit the pause soon? I, I think we're pretty close to being patient, uh, with, with rates. Um, my, my sense is that anytime you get to an equilibrium level, uh, you're going to have people on both sides but for so long now we've like, well, rates have to go up. Uh, I mean, even the people who didn't want them to go up and were like, uh, negotiating against raising rates saying, well, yeah, it doesn't make sense what we're doing. We, we've got to have a real interest rate. Uh, so, but now we're at a point where you can authentically uh, uh, dialogue about either side of that situation today. And that's what's different than what it's been um, before. So uh, re- relevant rates, uh, relevant uh, activity, Ultimately, supply and demand does play, even though we have in our society, we have delegated interest rates to a group, a a committee. That committee, if it's not aligned with the real market, ends up taking us off course and the real market does end up impacting the demand and supply of funds. So they can't just do whatever they want. They have to do what they think is going to be ultimately aligned with the economy. And I don't know if you've heard of R star, uh, but R star is the neutral rate of interest that isn't stimulative uh, or accommodative or restrictive. It's just right. It's perfect. And it's always a search for where that is. And for a long time, post great recession, we thought, oh, it's really low. Now we're thinking, no, it's not, it's not mm-hmm. ultra low. It's something higher. And so, uh, our star is kind of where the long term uh, rates are going to be. And the Fed would like to think it fits their dot plot long term. But again, they're interpreting what they think the economy is going to do and then putting rates accordingly. Right. But what the economy actually does, that's up to the economy. Yeah. It's, uh, so our star that uh, I don't uh, that's not ringing a bell from the college economics days. You know, so probably will pick your brain you a little bit more hear- about that. In the future. You will probably hear a lot more about it. I've started to hear uh, in the media things about the neutral rate of interest now, where I didn't hear that for 15 years. Yeah. just didn't hear about it. Yeah. It's interesting because I was listening to one of your old uh, uh, podcast episodes at another show, and, and you started talking about real interest rates. And 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 it just occurred to me, and I think we talked about this last time we talked, is like, wow, we're, we're going back to the, the old school textbooks talking about these different rate types again. Uh, in, yep. in a whole new way. So, 
Um, I, I wanted to get your reaction on uh, another set of headlines that we've had recently around some downgrades, uh, you know, for some pretty, you know, sizable, um, you know, regional banks. Uh, especially I think even just yesterday we've had a, a fresh wave uh, or S&P joining um, some of the other rating agencies and downgrading some of these institutions. Um, what's your, what's your take on that? What do you think, how do you think these particular institutions might be most impacted by this and, and how does it more specifically impact their um, deposit yeah. gathering strategies you think? Well, it obviously is a hindrance, um, just like it is to the the U.S. government when it gets downgraded. Um, it makes the the challenge just a little greater. Uh, but kind of going back to what I said earlier about the market, ratings are also a voting machine. You know, there's an opinion; it's an assessment. Now, it's a credible assessment because they they tend to be pretty professional and pretty uh, pretty thorough. And so, if a rating is being downgraded, there are going to be reasons and justifications. However, uh, there's a big difference between being downgraded and no longer being relevant. Uh, so in a world where you have FDIC insurance that's still viewed as legit and real and you know uh, 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 impactful, um, most people say, hey, I'm safe. So if my bank is not rated as well, but it pays me more, it gives me more, it fits my needs more, I'm going to bank where uh, where it makes sense, but if that's the you know if everything else is equal, I'm going to try to be with the safest bank. That's why we had the the move to the uh, to the large banks uh, when the regional banks were starting to be questioned. Uh, so I think it's real, Alex. In other words, I I don't think it's a non-event, but I don't think it's going to be something we're going to look back and say, wow, those those banks that took uh, downgrades from the rating agencies they had a significantly higher hurdle than everybody else. Uh, no, but it it certainly was another hindrance that they had to be more intentional about dealing with. Yeah, so just more obstacles uh, in the way, more than, than anything, at least just not an existential uh, issue. Um, good way to but, say but maybe just some molasses uh, in, in, uh, along yeah. the tracks there. One of the things I find in, in our world today, and again, I've been around a long time, but years and years ago, we used to expect things were going to be hard. It's just going to be hard. And now we seem to have this idea that we're either going to have utopia and everything's just amazing and wonderful or dystopia. Everything is going to be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, the real world is somewhere in between always. It's not utopia and it's not dystopia. So, you know, the pandemic created a dystopia. Uh, uh, mentality coming out of the pandemic we kind of had a euphoria yeah. and now we're like ah, maybe it's somewhere in between yeah this is it's an interesting uh analogy that you bring up i recall uh that former president barack obama said something similar he said you know it, from his perspective in his during his time in the job you know things were always not as bad as they seemed but they were also never as good as they seemed either right though the world just operated somewhere in that middle zone yet we kind of have this uh, emotional reaction to go to the extremes i know i certainly do as uh, someone who entered the the workforce in banking uh one or two years before the great recession where we were in that hey you know things are are pretty rocking i was a you know new hire at merrill lynch you know things were flying high uh you know yeah. two years later merrill lynch didn't exist uh, and then all of a sudden, I, I, you know, the the tone of, of my own prospects in the career and, you know, I've always now gravitated towards well, there's doom around the corner at all times just because we're we're sort of uh, institutionalized at this point uh, for those uh, extremes. So I appreciate you at least bringing us back to uh, to center and reminding us that things are probably a little bit more uh, in the middle than than we typically think. So. Uh, you know, you last time we we chatted offline, one of the things that uh, that you you brought to my attention, which I thought was interesting, was the notion of pressure gauges um, that uh, that you and your company uh, tend to track um, across mm -hmm. a variety of institutions. 
uh, and and when we chatted, you you pulled up a couple of examples and just showed me, uh, you know, just some of those um, those things that you measure uh, in that pressure gauge. Um, you know, talk talk to me about how tools like that are really uh, useful. Um, you know, for wh- whether you're uh, an executive running a bank uh, and you want to keep track of metrics, or you're someone who's analyzing how the banks are performing. You know, how what is the um, you know, how do you leverage things like your your pressure gauge for your your day to day strategic uh, decisions? Yeah. Well, this was certainly an evolution in it's coming to to be. Um, we uh, when I started the business, I I thought, oh, I'm going to help people, I'm going to help bankers and, and financial institutions manage long term savings. Well, who can I help? I figured I can help the, those who need it most, those who are really struggling. And then I found the people who are sometimes really struggling aren't really that attentive to all the issues. And so it's hard to help them. Mm-hmm. But pressure, which means, hey, if we don't make the right decisions, there are going to be some consequences. Now, if they don't have pressure, they just don't have as many you know, potential negative consequences. But pressure doesn't mean performance. That's one thing I'd, I'd just like to say as I talk about pressure gauge. Our pressure gauge for bank funding looks at two things. It looks at how much we're paying for our most expensive deposits, sort of the marginal deposit. If we need more deposits, we usually run a CD special. How much are we paying for those? So compared to the peer, are we paying more or less? The more we pay, the more pressure. And then loan to core deposit. There's no doubt, and the regulations are getting even more focused. The regulators are getting more focused in on funding for obvious reasons. So if your loan to core deposit ratio is high, you're going to get a lot of intense pressure from the regulators and probably internally and from the board as well. So when we put those two things together years ago, and people would say, oh, who makes a good client for you? We would say, well, it's not necessarily the people who are bad performers, because there may be some reasons why management, why, uh, why they're, they're struggling. We like to work with high performers who have a lot of pressure. And the consequences of their decisions make make a difference. So when we find a high performer who has a high cost of of CDs and a high loan to deposit ratio, let's talk to them. Let's go see if we can help them because they're probably going to be interested in better ways. So we had that as kind of a private tool. You know, we we pulled the FDIC data. We had that data. and, And then people would call us and say, how about this bank? And how about this one? And then finally, one day dawned on us. Well, why don't we actually publish it? Because we're not we're not making any judgments here. We're not we're not saying, hey, this is a good bank, this is a bad bank. We're, we're none of that. We're simply saying, here are the metrics. You you decide, and then we rank them by percentile. So this pressure gauge uh, would tell you if you pull up any uh, FDIC cert number or bank name, key it in. It's going to tell you how much pressure they have relative to, to industry peers. Now, if I'm in a market. Um, I'd love to have my competitors have very little pressure because if the competitors, if you look at the pressure of your competitor, I guarantee you the ones that have a high pressure are going to be aggressive competitors when it comes to pricing and going out and getting business. So it's good to know what your pressure is, but it's also really important to know the pressure of your competitors because you can start to anticipate what their motivations are going to be, and maybe some of the actions that they might take. Yeah, and so are, are you suggesting that there's some sort of leading indicator factor in, in kind of how they're going to show up in their go-to-market strategies uh, behind that? Absolutely. Yeah. This this is a, that's a good term for it, leading indicator for someone who's going to be very attentive to deposits. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, you you did also bring up um, certainly after the last rate hike, which is, I guess probably almost a month ago now, uh, you, you you sent me an email, and, and really that was the genesis of of today's um, episode. Uh, you know, you wanted to um, you know spotlight that there's actually a, a pretty interesting opportunity for for many institutions out there, um, and to preface that. Um, you know, you also shared an article with me uh, that you had published a year ago, um, suggesting that the next refinance boom uh, might not be in mortgages, uh, you know, but might be in in uh, CDs or other deposit products, right? So, uh, you know, one of the things that that you'd brought up to to, to my attention is, hey, there's this, um, uh, I guess, what maybe this under the radar um, 
strategy that certain institutions can employ. Do you mind sharing with the audience, um, you know, your thinking behind that, and 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 perhaps if, you know to those bank executives that might be listening, you know, what are some things that they could look into within their own institutions to implement um, a strategy like this? Well. It's obviously something that we do want to talk about, and we do know that there's a lot of tension on this subject. Let me let me give you just a little history to set this up. Uh, so years and years ago, um, uh, when I started in banking, nobody knew what a refinance was. It just didn't happen. But we all know refinancing of mortgages today. Oh, sure, if rates fall, I can I can lower my cost of my mortgage. And so if you mention refinance, everybody in the world knows what that is. So that changed, right? It wasn't that way, but now it is. Now, for 30 years, rates went down. And at some point in my career, I said, you know, this refinance thing on mortgages would be just the opposite. If interest rates went up, we wouldn't refinance our debt. We as consumers would refinance our assets. So I'm managing a bank. I don't want that to happen to damage my bank. So what do we do? We modified early withdrawal penalties. We didn't have 90 day penalties anymore because that 90 days of interest penalty, that's all based upon an interest rate that has nothing to do with the financial opportunity of trading out the account. So Alex, um, I remember back 20 years ago, I went to a group of my peers and I said, guys, if we went to a freshman college class, I mean, these are not experts. And we said, hey, you're in a, you're in a freshman, freshman finance class. If you have contracts with people and they break, the counterparty breaks the contract, how would you determine the damage that you would assess in the penalty? Well, everyone without any prior knowledge would say, well, it should be based on the damage it does, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, if, if we have a long contract and the difference between that contract price and the new price that's available in the market today is major, then, then the breakage is going to have to be major. But if it's a short term and the difference between market value and, and the book value or the, the current rate, it's not much, then there shouldn't be much penalty. That 90 days or six months of interest has nothing to do with the damage done. And that was all interesting theory, Alex. But over time, rates moved typically down and they'd come up a little bit, right? Nothing like we've seen here in the last 18 months. So if you go out today and you find various tools like CD Valet and depositaccounts.com, you'll find that in those tools, Someplace they'll have something about breakage fees and calculating the, the value. If you were to trade out of a current account that might have so many months of interest, just think about it. It was just a year ago that 1% was a pretty attractive CD rate. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm getting 1%. But 1%, if you have a six-month penalty on $100,000, $100,000 CD, 1%. Well, six months, half of, of one year's interest, that's $500. All right, $500. That doesn't sound trivial, but how much could you make on a $100,000 CD today on interest? 5% is $5,000 per year. That little $500 penalty, pretty insignificant. Right. So what happened to us, to the banks that didn't acknowledge this vulnerability in their asset liability process, most bankers that I talked to, and I brought it up to a lot of bankers, Alex, I'd say, hey, have you reassessed your early withdrawal penalties? Uh, they're the same as what they've always been. Uh, and we haven't had any problems. Well, yeah, yeah, they may be the same structure. In other words, six months of interest, but they aren't the same as what they were back when interest rates were four or 5%. Because the interest rate determined when you're using so many months of interest, determined the penalty. And when do you need a penalty? When interest rates are low, I'm going to go higher. So the tension here, Alex, and the reason I thought that you'd, you and I'd have a good conversation is there are a lot of bankers who are right now just holding their breath, hoping nobody finds out about this. Yeah. Hey, this is going to be our little secret because if our depositors knew about this, 
we would be losing deposits that we want to keep at one or sub two or sub three percent rates. So what's happening today is that the 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 banks that are progressive, instead of going out and battling for all the accounts looking for a home, like, oh, I've got a CD at mature and I need to go find a home for it. I'm going to go look for an opportunity. Here's what the brightest are doing. They're saying, you know what? I'm, I know there are people in my market space or out of my market space who have low rates and they think they're trapped in those because there are supposedly substantial penalties for early withdrawal. And they're sitting there, mostly senior citizens, sitting there going, just kicking myself. I shouldn't have let that CD renew last time because I still have another 13 months or 23 months or some amount of time. But gosh, I hear there's a penalty for early withdrawal. Here's what the best and brightest are doing. They're reaching out using direct mail, using digital marketing, and they're reaching out and saying, Alex, do you or a loved one have a bank or credit union CD? Give us the numbers and we'll run a no obligation analysis. We'll just run a complimentary assessment of would you be better off to take the penalty? We don't know what your penalty is and tell you until you do the research and find out what it is, but you should know what your penalty is. Take your penalty off of the principal and interest, bring that money over to our bank, and we're gonna give you a, a fair price today. And when you run the numbers, we're gonna give you a certificate that matures on the exact same day as your current CD. So you're not gonna take any risk. You're not gonna have any repricing risk. Oh, now I've got a different maturity. No we can actually create a CD that matures on the exact same day as your current one. And you can calculate if you leave it in that account that you have currently, what's it gonna be worth? This is just simple finance math. What's it gonna be worth if you leave it? Then if you were to pay the penalty and transfer it over to us, we're gonna show you exactly in dollars what it would be worth. Alex, today we run that on a $100,000 CD. It is not unusual to have 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. We even have sometimes $7,000 of difference depending upon how long the CD is and what the inf interest rate differential is. These people can put thousands of dollars in their pocket and the financial institution helping them do it isn't paying a premium. The financial institutions actually can pay sometimes a little less because just think about it. If you're out there, you've got your matured account and you're looking for a home for your well, you're going to shop. You're going to go, hey, I, I need to get the highest rate and I'm going to look for all the highest rates. But if, if I come to you and I say, hey, my financial institution can trade you out of your old account and I can give you several thousand dollars worth of gain, there's a rapport being built there. You're going, wow, is this, is this legit? Oh, yeah. It's legit. It seems scammy a little We're bit up front, right? When you're, when you're promising that yeah. kind of uh, differential. And you, but you do have to run the numbers. We have a, a tool that we can visually show them. Yeah. We can show them and, and they can confirm with their current bank. Hey, yeah, if you keep it here, this is what you're going to get. It's just math. And then, but we can confirm if you transfer that money net of penalty over to us, you're going to get, sometimes it's 5,000, sometimes it's 6,000. It depends on the size of the CD and everything, but running the numbers every CD owner should today be doing. Now, we're talking to a group of financial institutions today. And when I say that, they're all going, oh no, we don't want our clients running the numbers. So here's what we do. We don't broadcast this in social media. Uh, we're not out there saying to every consumer, you should refinance your, your accounts. What we do instead is we work with companies like AmSiv, to uh, they're a direct marketing campaign company and they pull the data from our clients and they say oh you have all of these accounts we do not do not want to uh, introduce this idea to them but in this market that you want to go after here are a bunch of likely prospects let's send a targeted message to them uh, that says do you or a loved one own a bank cd if you do you'd be wasting thousands of dollars and the responses by those people is, well, this seems, I'm, like you said, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, but I got nothing to lose by just finding out. And they contact us and we run the numbers for them. And back in the day, before interest rates went up, 
Here's what would happen. You know, I can't really make you much money, but thank you for the opportunity. If interest rates rise in the future, would you like me to, to, uh, to get a hold of you? And in order to run the analysis, they told us what bank or credit union they were with. They told us how many dollars they had. They told us when it would mature. They told us what interest rate was is at. Alex, this is huge CRM value. Yeah. We're getting information. So as it gets close to maturity, this, is, this isn't this is happening now. This was happening before rates rose. Just running the idea gave us valuable information about that prospective depositor. Now, of course, virtually all of them have a net benefit to transfer right now. There's no waiting around. Uh, very significant net benefits to transfer. Now, as, as interest rates stop rising or potentially fall, that window will close for the value of immediate transfer. But the value of having the consultative conversation about should you consider options today, trading out of an old account into a new one, it's still valuable, even if they don't transfer today. I, I covered a lot of bases there. You probably have a question or two. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I think there's just something probably unique about where we are in the cycle of changes that that makes this, right? Because if we were anticipating even further hikes in the future, then th th it might not be because well, you, you, you potentially would have to do this kind of play again and again. Um, yes. however, given that we're likely reaching the top now, it's, now it's a good opportunity. It's maybe it's like a once in a, in a generation opportunity to, to, to run this kind of play. Um, especially as rates now, you know, might start to stabilize and not, not fluctuate as much, which would take this kind of play off the table, um, you know, in a year or two years down the road. Right. So you got it. Yeah. So I like how you brought this up uh, to the audience here. You mentioned that I wrote an article a year ago, and I did. Uh, and it was sort of that anticipation of this. And then after writing the article, I kind of went, let's just keep this on the down low for a while. And the reason being exactly what you said. If we would have gotten really aggressive with this uh, and it was kind of marginal impact, it's like, man, we could, we could, you know, maybe. But today, it's not a marginal impact. If you want to move money from, from your competitors to you today, there's no better way than, than coming across to that depositor as the hero of the story. Right. We are heroes when we help people do something that they thought they were trapped in a bad deal and we liberate them from it. Today, that liberation is a real opportunity. They won't remember every CD that they, that they owned but I guarantee you they will remember who helped them get out of a deal they thought they were trapped in that was not good. And they opened the door to significant value. Now, usually when I talk to bankers, they see it as a zero sum game. Hey, if we give up value to, or, you know, to get value, we have to give up value. This is not a zero sum game. Because we can give really good value to that depositor and they can get really good value. The loser is very clear, the bank of current deposit. The banks that are sitting there with trivial penalties, even against our advice over all these years, we say, hey, check out your penalties. You can find lots of articles where we've said, fortify your penalties, bankers, fortify them. Guess what most bankers did? nothing right they thought Just, the moat eh. was deep enough that they didn't have to worry about that uh, and now we're, we're no. there's little puddles maybe i don't know <laughs> so so you know i have empathy but i can tell you there were lots of warnings and those who didn't take the warning you know okay there are consequences now here's the deal though the opportunity to do this today and that's the reason why i contacted you this is prime time this right. is the time where the bank can get real value, the depositors can get real value, and the current bank of deposits is going to lose. There's, yeah, they're going to pick up their penalty, but they're trivial. So that's that's why uh, I had to be super patient. It was hard. I wanted to call you January 1st and say, Alex, we should do a podcast uh, about refinancing CDs. And even when we talked last time, I wanted to emphasize it more. I feel like now's prime time. Now's prime. So uh, to all the bankers out there, how can they uh, learn more about this? Um, you know, how can they um, reach out to you 
uh, yeah. and have a conversation. That's a great, uh, thank you for that invitation. Uh, our, our website is thecorepoint.com. Uh, and if you go out there, you'll see a, a little link that you can set up a demonstration. And uh, if you just, it, it's going to have my calendar out there, it's going to find an open spot, set up a demonstration, and we would be happy to show you what we call CD Revolution. Uh, that's our brand name for this uh, refinancing. We talk about it as refinancing, but internally, we our proprietary name is CD Revolution. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Neil, again, for, for coming on to The Purposeful Banker. You're uh, officially now on regular status, right? Having now done your second episode uh, this year, and Bravo. we certainly look forward to uh, to you stopping by again. Uh, in the coming months, I would actually love to get a, a retrospective on this particular strategy. I want you know to, to see or maybe hear some stories uh, of some of the conversations that you're having, um, you know, with, with with your clients on day to day basis around strategies just like these. Because you know, there's no shortage of, of um, institutions out there that could could use a pretty good strategy right now. So um, we certainly appreciate your wisdom here on the channel. Well, and I know your audience is a cut above the, the industry average because uh, they are, are attuned to really good technology. And we've brought together technology and the environment, the interest rate environment with this particular product. And it would be an honor to be back on and give you a retrospective or maybe a, just an update because it's probably not going to be over anytime soon. But, uh, but, uh, but we would love that, Alex. So thank you for the opportunity. And that's it for this week's episode of The Purposeful Banker. If you'd like to catch more episodes, please subscribe to the show wherever you like to listen to podcasts, including Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. You can also catch the show now on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. It really helps get the message out there. And if you have a moment to spare, let us know what you think in the comments. You can head over to Q2.com to learn more about the company behind the content. Until next time, this is Alex Habit, and you've been listening to The Purposeful Banker.